to have you with us this morning in worship, worshiping the Lord uh, together. We've got our Guatemala team out on mission uh, this morning, and so we pray uh, for them. We are continuing our series this morning entitled uh, Cultivate, where we've been looking at virtues uh, to cultivate in everyday life, virtues that honor Christ uh, with our character and who we are. I was reading the other day about some of our childhood fears that we have. Uh, we're scared the, the monster is going to get us, so we sleep with the light on. Anybody do that? Craig still does that, uh, but uh, you, you maybe um, you're scared that uh, somebody's going to come get you, so you sleep with the blanket up around your eyes, or uh, scared that if you eat a watermelon seed, you're going to get a watermelon growing in your belly. Uh, you know, unfortunately, these uh, stressors, anxiety, uh, never leads us. I saw recently there was a study done by the American Psychiatric Association in 2018 that said 39% of Americans were more stressed than the year before. Uh, 39% experienced the same levels of high stress, and only 19% actually decreased their stress or anxiety from 2017 to 2018. The top three stressors, in case you were wondering, number one, health. 68% of respondents re reported that being the number one stressor. Uh, number two, keeping themselves or their families safe. And then number three, finances. Close behind were relational struggles and politics. I can't imagine why. Arguably, these are all tied together. As one uh, researcher notes, they seem to parallel the different areas of tension that currently dominate political news and conversation. It seems as if there may be a vicious cycle fueled by these fears, which may drive rigid political stances and in turn fuel further fear. On our, on our TV recently, we've started recording the show uh, Live PD. It's not cops where it's been all edited. It's you can go live. They've got four or five camera crews embedded all over the nation with law enforcement. Uh, and so you can watch exactly what they're doing. But now I, I saw that they're doing a live rescue where you can uh, jump in with first responders, EMTs, and see uh, all this trauma developing. And it's kind of cool to watch, but at the end of the day, you've got to ask yourself what we are exposing to, or you've got to make the observation that what we are exposing ourselves to is constant trauma. Our brains are constantly seeing trauma, whether it's news sites, whether it's cable television, whether it's cable news networks, or whether it's even social media. Our brains are constantly being exposed to trauma, whether it's the trauma of a loss of health, the trauma of a loss of safety, the trauma of a loss of money, the trauma of a loss of a relationship. You know, our ancestors had to deal with anxiety too. There certainly were stressful times and human history passed, but they weren't constantly being bombarded with the problems of the entire world 24 hours a day seven days a week at their fingertips. And that's the world we find ourselves in, which has led some to call this season an anxiety epidemic, that it has reached epic and epidemic proportions. You know, we are wired to sense and react to threat. And the way many of us respond to these threats is with anxiety. But what I want us to look at this morning is, did God create us simply to be anxious? Did God create us just to sit around and worry about the future? Did God create us just so that we would be worried about our own safety? Did God create us so that we would have to worry if, if we are loved? Did God create us just so that we have to wonder if we are going to be provided for? Is it possible for us to experience freedom from constant worry? The good news is that God never expected us to live with high levels of anxiety all the time. And so this morning, I want us to discover the biblical alternative to anxiety, and it's found in contentment. If you have your Bible, let's look in the book of Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 4. It'll also be on uh, the screens. Uh, most scholars think that Paul wrote this uh, while he was in prison in Rome. If you ever wondered, where does John, when he writes this sermon, does he just ascend to some cloud somewhere? No. Kitchen table and coffee. And coffee is essential to that process. Some Holy Spirit just seems to work better when there's coffee. I don't know what it is, or at least I stay awake. Uh, but some of the pro popular prosperity gospel preachers, they write, you know, these mansions. But Paul didn't look like my house, didn't look like these other guys' houses. 
He's writing from some kind of prison cell that may have looked something like that. But as we're reading this text today, uh, Paul's writing this church in Philippi, arguably his favorite church. And he's going to express some thanks for a monetary gift that they had sent him through a messenger. And he's expressing thanks. Hey, thank you that you thought of me. Thank you that you uh, are remembering me. But Paul was very leery of money matters. And so you're going to kind of see him walk this tight rope. Because though they sent him this gift, he didn't want them to think that's why he cared for them. Because in that day and age, it was common for these religious leaders to go from town to town, to stand on street corners, uh, to gain a following, and then to ask for money. And so Paul was always very leery of money matters and, and, and making sure his motives were, were, were right and proper and that people understood that. And so as we're reading, you're going to kind of see that, that tightrope walk that Paul's uh, doing here in Philippians chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need. Talking about that gift that he received for them. He says this, For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Then in verse 13, he gives the secret. I can do all of this through him who gives me Strength. You see that, that tightrope that he's walking there. He's wanting to demonstrate, hey, I'm thankful for this support. This support's going to help. It's going to go a long way. But, but he wants them to understand, I'm not dependent upon uh, this support. I'm not motivated by that support because Paul wants them to be clear that his joy does not depend on the alleviation of physical discomfort. And this is critical to understanding this text, is that he wants them to understand that his joy does not depend on the elimination of of the physical discomfort, that although he's in prison, although his life is potentially in danger, although he perhaps needs funds, all situations that would naturally cause anxiety to rise, Paul says he's not in need. He's content. What is contentment? Well, it comes from uh, a word that the Stoic philosophers back in that day When they used it, they meant self-sufficient. As a verb, it means to be content is to be possessed of sufficient strength, to be strong, to be enough, and to defend oneself. As an adjective, as it's used here in this text, it means sufficient in oneself. Paul, though, is not saying we are sufficient in and of ourselves. He says there's a secret to contentment that the world doesn't know. He is strong enough because of the one who gives him strength. And then in Philippians 4.13, he says, I can do all of this, face whatever circumstance I face. I can do all of this through Christ who gives me the strength. And so I think we could define contentment this way. It is Christ's sufficient strength for whatever I face today. Christ's sufficient strength for whatever I face today. He was able to face these anxiety-inducing circumstances by understanding he was possessed by Christ. In Christ, he was sufficient. In Christ, he was enough. In Christ, he was safe. There was a power that was at work in Paul that was greater than Paul himself, greater than that which is in the world, and that power is Christ Jesus. And he was wanting the Philippians to understand this. And so for us, in Christ, you are strong enough. In Christ, you are enough. In Christ, you are safe. You may not feel safe in this world. Jesus said, in this world, we we will have trouble. That's a given. You may, in fact, think that you're weak in the eyes of society. You may feel like you're lacking for your spouse. You may feel like you're lacking for your friends, that you're not good enough in all these other areas. You may feel like you you lack for your children and aren't enough for them. You may feel like you lack for your parents and you aren't enough for them. But in Christ, you have sufficient strength for whatever you face today. In Christ, you have sufficient strength 
You are enough in him for whatever you face today. It was Jesus who told us, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, he said, will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that's why the focus has to be on what what am I needed to do today? What am I going to be focused on today? Because when we understand we are in Christ, we understand that we have sufficient strength for this day. Now, let's go back and talk for a minute about anxiety, where we began this conversation. What is anxiety? Here's how I'll define it for our purposes this morning. Anxiety is an emotion that's characterized by feelings of tension, uh, worried thoughts, and potential physical changes. Okay, It's an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and potential physical changes. Oftentimes, when we're talking about anxiety, it's characterized by an uneasiness. It's characterized by a nervousness. Maybe it's over an impending event. Maybe it's uh, over an anticipated event. It can be accompanied often by physical signs, tension, uh, sweating, an increased pulse rate, uh, blood pressure. Anxiety is an automatic response to threat. Whether it's real or whether it's imagined, anxiety can kick in. And it's a natural reaction that at its core, it's, it's needed. And we need anxiety for self-preservation. Anxiety can help make us more alert. It can help uh, make us more self-conscious. It makes us highly motivated to take action. And so there's a, a good part of anxiety that keys us in that, hey, my attention is needed here. Hey, my focus is needed here. Hey, there's something here going on that I need to, to work on and to be alert to. The problem is many of us live constantly, chronically in a state of anxiety. And you were never intended to live that way. You were not meant to live that way. And you are not capable of living that way and having any kind of healthy physical state or spiritual state. Because anxiety, what anxiety can also do is be a tremendous paralyzer. It's actually derived from a word get this, that means to choke. And if you experience anxiety, which I think all of us have, you know that feeling. It feels like we're being choked. It causes pain by squeezing. And so what happens is when anxiety is prolonged, when anxiety is intense, it can have a strangling effect It can have that effect physically. It can have that effect spiritually. I believe it's all connected. It can deplete our energy. It can disturb our thinking. It can divide out our loyalties and what we know we ought to be doing versus what we fear. Uh, The family of words that that come with anxiety comes with uh, tightness and narrowness, suffocation. Non-clinical anxiety, I'll talk about more uh, about that in a moment, but non-clinical anxiety is experiencing failure in advance. And many of us walk around life, we view our children, we view our parents, we view the world, we view uh, maybe even our church, maybe our country. It's just, it's already doomed, it's already failed. And so we walk around living life that way. And so anxiety then tightens our functioning, tightens our thinking, It restrains our behavior. Anxiety reduces our capacity to learn. It reduces our capacity to empathize. It replaces curiosity with a demand for certainty. It stiffens our position over and against another, among many other things. Does this sound like the world we live in? Are you starting to get anxious about your anxiety yet? Because anxiety is contagious. Anxiety is contagious, and it can run through churches. It will run through families. It'll run through generations. It'll it'll run through the country. Anxiety is pervasive. And here's what human beings tend to do when they're anxious. We can ignore, distance, or flee, and just avoid that situation. It makes me anxious, so I'm just going to avoid it. Some of us cut off, whether it's a person or a group, we just... Shut them off. Quit dealing with them. That's not healthy. Uh, Others of us might just freeze. 
You just don't do anything. You just kind of live in ignorant bliss, and that will take a toll on you. Even if, as much as you think you're just tuning it out, that will take a toll on you. Others of us are tempted to fight. Scapegoat, blaming on other people. Um, We've got to find a culprit. So that's the basic responses that human beings have. Let's go back and think about our text for a minute. Paul's in prison, writing this letter. He's received this gift. What's he saying? And I think an observation we can make is that our contentment does not depend on the alleviation of hardship. Paul does not consider physical deprivation an unmitigated disaster. Likewise, Paul does not see physical comfort as the sign of success. Some things just are. But for Paul, as long as Christ is preached, he was joyful. I'm not always that way. I I hope to be. I want to be that way. But for Paul, as long as Christ is, is preached, he is joyful. He doesn't want the Philippians to think that his joy is based solely on the elimination or the alleviation of his discomfort. He also doesn't want to be ungrateful to him. But Paul's contentment rested in the advancement of the gospel. If more people got to hear about God's good love that has been revealed in Christ Jesus, then whatever he had to do to do it, if that meant physical suffering, he would would do that. And so I want you to think for a minute about what causes your anxiety to rise. Paul said, I've learned to be content in all circumstances. I'm still working on that. I don't know where you are in that, but... What causes you to be discontent? What causes your anxiety to rise? For some of us, it might be an uncertain future. Man, if we just knew the future, anxiety would be a whole lot less. For some of us, it's finances. Who wouldn't want to have more money? And if we had more money, then all our problems would go away. For some of us, it's relational turmoil, and that's what's causing us some anxiety this morning. Uh, Think about these different scenarios. Most of them, nearly all of them, are pretty much moving targets, are they not? Because they depend on other people and forces beyond your control, other broken people that also have their own free will to make decisions that can be good and bad. And so what happens is our contentment becomes very much a moving target that's, that's built on the decisions of other broken people. What Paul's saying is strength for today is found in Christ. It's found in the advancement of the gospel. And there are no guarantees. And if somebody's promised you this before, they're wrong. There are no guarantees that your hardship will be eliminated or alleviated. And so we've got to look for contentment from another direction. And what Paul's saying, and and the good thing is Jesus nor Paul's never been through anything that's their life wasn't easy all the time by any stretch of the imagination. And so ignoring or running from our anxious circumstances won't cure it. That won't help. In fact, the more we run, I believe that will play out in our current relationships, and it will also play out in our health. And so contentment does not depend on the alleviation of hardship. The second major observation I would say based on this text is that God supplies the needs of his people by giving them the resource to cope with the hardship. Paul, in this text, is surrounded from hostility, from unbelievers who've thrown him in prison, from believers whose selfish ambition has driven them to make life miserable for Paul. He, here he is, he's in prison, he's pacing, facing a possible uh, death sentence, and God is nevertheless meeting his needs even in prison. And so in anxious times, we've got to be like Paul. and In those times, we lean in, to the work of God in the world. Just like he met Paul's needs, just like he met the Philippian church's needs, he's going to meet our needs, that God is fully able and and willing to meet whatever needs we have. Now, that doesn't mean that the check is magically going to show up in the mail. Sometimes things are orchestrated that way, and it's awesome when it does happen that way. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes the suffering is eliminated. It doesn't always happen that way, but sometimes it does. But sometimes obedience requires physical deprivation to do the things God wants us to do. It's not going to be easy. It won't be. You know, this year for us in our home has been a year of anxiety. (laughs) You're getting what I have to learn. 
this morning. Whether it's experiencing the loss of loved ones that we've experienced this year, whether it's nothing major but just constant sickness going through the home, mounting medical bills that come from long hospital stays, or for us, long hospital stays, the anxiety rises. And so we've got to find that that Christ gives, gives us the resources. And this week, as I was wrestling with some things, and we'd another round of sickness in the home, and, and you start to look about, and I started thinking about Psalm 23. My wife was thinking about Psalm 23 and talking about the Lord, our shepherd, and sometimes you just get this very uh, tranquil um, uh, picture. But if you notice in Psalm 23, he talks about preparing a table in, the, in front of the enemies. Like Psalm 23 is written for times of tremendous stress and tremendous turmoil. And that the, the good shepherd, God's the good shepherd, is not just sitting over there, you know, fishing and just kind of hanging out. The shepherd is like watching, intently watching his sheep and is, is protecting them from threats. And you know what? This side of heaven, sometimes things happen even to the point of death. But, but praise be to God who is that good shepherd who's already laid down his life for his sheep. And there's eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so for us, for, for me, as I've gone through this season, I've picked up this uh, This book recently by a lady named Phyllis Tickle, great last name, Um, but uh, it's called The Divine Hours. It's prayers for summertime, and there's prayers, and it's it's not just a book, no, it's got scripture all through it. It's got Old Testament, Psalms, New Testament, The Divine Hours, prayers for summertime, and you can do them morning, middle of the day, evening day. Um, And for sure, I'd start the day with this, and I can notice when that doesn't happen, anxiety just rises. And so we've got to be grounded in a story that's bigger than ourselves. And I'm going to say this. Anxiety is what happens when we pray to ourselves. And so for me, when I feel anxiety rise, prayer and scripture and remembering that I'm a part of this story that is so much bigger than me, that God's work and this world are so much bigger than me, it reframes it and it just gives me a new perspective on, on my day. And so Paul's message rings true throughout history. I have strength for everything in the one who gives me power. Christ gave Paul the resources he needed to deal with the hardship. Doesn't mean it's going to be alleviated or eliminated. But that day, and that's been true for us, all along the way, as hard and difficult and uncertain as some things have been, the right thing has happened at the right time. You know, hardship tempts us to think that God is uh, unmoved or by our plight or that somehow God is against us. And so we begin to despair. And so in anxious times, we start to think, is God against me? But, but the cross reveals that, no, God is for us. God is with us. Uh, God is ahead of us. Uh, that Christ loves us. That he sent his son to die for us so that we would be with him forever. And so God will give us the resource to face that hardship. The third thing I want to say is that the secret to contentment, Jesus enables us to face a strength that comes from the outside, that contentment listens to Christ, not circumstances. Paul learned that secret of contentment. He lived in plenty. He lived in one. He had both. But he knew in Christ Jesus a strength that came from the outside, a strength that he was not capable of. It's now no longer a secret. He's putting this out there. He's saying, in Christ, you have that strength. Now, here's, here's where the world, now let's go back to the world we live in for a minute. 24-hour news network, uh, social media, it plays on our fears. You know, a shark attack, I was reading, some of you may look up an article and may have a different statistic, but it's still really high. 94.9 million to one odds that you're going to get bitten and killed by a shark. We'd go to the beach last week. My son, terrified to get in the water because there's sharks. Ends up, he gets in the water, has a blast. He'd get in the beach and swim down to Mexico if he could, but he didn't want to do, you know, we didn't let him. But uh, swimming, the odds of, of dying, sw- drowning, 20, 225,000 to one. We worry about the shark attack. Swimming is far more dangerous. Same thing's through with airplanes and tra- uh, car travel. I mean, the newscasters and social media algorithm creators know that fear captures us. Fear is what causes us to log on, to keep scrolling. Fear is what causes us to tune in. 
And I, was, I read this quote recently, and I thought it was especially appropriate. My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. And you say, oh, John, well, no, it has happened. Bad things do happen. As I look around the room, some of you have been through some terrible things. And, 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 and go ahead and make the list of all that you're worried about in the future. But, but if you're going to make that list, I want you to also go back and make the list of all the things you worried about that you can't remember anymore, that you need to go remember, or that never happened. How much of your life did you spend worrying about things that never came to fruition? It was King Jesus who said, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Think about those things that never happened. And then think about those things. Go ahead and think about those things that did happen. And you're here today. And somehow throughout all of that, God supplied, God provided. May not have been the way you wanted, how you wanted. Doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly God's will for you. But you made it through. And people have been there. You see, to cultivate contentment, we've got to be listening to the voice of God. Hearing the stories of Scripture, remembering we're, we're not the first to face this. You know, Jesus was no Zen Buddhist, okay? Um, he was anguished. In fact, it talks about him sweating blood. There wasn't always tranquility. There are things to be anxious about. But I think the problem in the Bible with anxiety uh, most of our anxiety is that it, it, its root is in idolatry. Its roots in idolatry. That, that deep down, there, there's this concern that God is going to give us a stone instead of bread. And so for some of us, our anxiety, we need to explore some of the deep things we believe and think about God. But, but the root of our anxiety may be the approval we want from other people. And that's created an idol. For others of us, we want a wider lens of our life, and knowing the future has created this idol for us. Think about those funny fears we had as children for a minute. We can look back, and they're funny because the threat has been eliminated. The danger is no longer there anymore. And it's through the Scripture and through being grounded in, in prayer and, and deep prayer with the Lord and being in community with other people and staying connected to the body that we remember this larger story that we're a part of. And it was Paul who said, be anxious about nothing. But, but in prayer and petition, bring your requests before God. So Seek counsel, journal, write, whatever you need to do. This week, as Eli and I were walking through some things, like, God, we don't even know what to pray in the situation but we trust the Spirit's going to pray on our behalf and that God is for us and that He loves us. And so uh, when we're, we're tempted to run from what's causing anxiety or fight what's causing us anxiety, I would say lean into it. Don't try to make it go away easily. It's probably not going to go away easily. And don't just try to make your path easy for your kids. Uh, don't try to make it easy for your parents. Well, some of you, yes, you need to make it easy on your parents. But you need to walk through it. And you need to maintain your principles and who you are in Christ and walk through it and be a lesser anxious person. You know, all around we're, we're, we're turning and people are going, did you hear? Did you miss it? Just be a calming presence. And it'll go a long way towards calming the folks around you. Now, I will say this. For some, anxiety does reach a very high level chronically. And with the best practices, prayer, it just seems to continue to stay high, stay in Scripture, being a part of the body of Christ. And that's why I support a holistic approach to dealing with anxiety. And that does and should include, if that's where you are, seeing professional counselors. There is no weakness in that. There is only strength in that. And that's a really positive step we can take. And then for some, medication does need to be uh, utilized and can actually help those chemicals balance out better in the brain and reach an equilibrium that's a lot better and more healthy. And I've seen good, godly people pray, read scripture, uh, go to counseling, uh, get on some medication, and just reach a whole nother level in their spiritual life of trust in the Lord and finding contentment. So if that's where you are, that, there's no shame in that. But I, it, throughout this series, I've tried to give us several different takeaways we can use 
Uh, and as I put these on the screen, don't let all nine of these cause tremendous anxiety that you need to do them all, okay? But maybe pick two or three uh, that you would implement this week uh, to help you cultivate some contentment. And some of these may at first seem kind of unrelated, uh, but as you start doing them, you'll start putting into practices that help you be more present where you are and with the people you love the most and ought to be loving the most. So number one, begin and end your day with prayer. And note the levels of anxiety at each point. Okay, I'm at a two this morning, but I was at a 10 tonight. Something happened and it just sent me and I'm at a 10. Or the other way around. Or maybe it just stayed the same. But just for a week, what if you tried praying and just make a note in your phone. I was at a five this morning and I was at a 10 tonight. Whatever it is. Um, Exercise one more time than normal this week. And I realize that just saying exercise just shot some anxiety through the roof. I get it. But exercise has this opportunity, I think God made us this way, uh, to actually release anxiety-inducing chemicals into our system. That that, that it can actually cause anxiety to go down when we exercise. God made our body that way. And so that's why if you normally work out three times, try doing four this week. If you don't work out at all and this causes a tremendous level of anxiety, go for a walk and work into a sweat. It shouldn't be that hard in July here in Abilene. So do that and, and, and notice, it may, you may have anxiety going into it and during it, but afterwards you will feel a lot better. And that's a good practice. Eat at least one healthy meal with family. Just being present with family, uh, having that substantive conversation, quality time, that could be why you're having that meal, but have, have a conversation where you're enjoying. I mean, you're, the people in your life, we're just so focused on the next thing, next thing, next thing. Focus on, on, and enjoy those folks because you only have this moment. That's all you, you got. Uh, we don't, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, play a game with family or friends. That just helps us be more present and have fun and enjoy that moment. Uh, give a possession away. Uh, maybe you have something that you know others could benefit from and you don't need it anymore. Maybe you do need it, but just giving it away would be a, a powerful step. So uh, give something away. Fast from social media for a week. What? I know. You've heard the phrase FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. And for some of us, we got a lot of FOMO. Fear of missing out. It's because we always feel like there's a party going on somewhere else out there that we hadn't been invited to. And and social media only, I can't imagine being a middle schooler or high schooler having to deal with that every day. I'm glad it didn't exist when I was in school. Uh, But social media only heightens that sense because now you see what they're doing. And now you know where they're going, and you, you, know, you know you're not included. So we got fear of missing out. Oh, I heard about that. What if we flipped that around? Instead of FOMO, we said JOMO. What's that? Joy of missing out. We say, you know what? I'm going to be content where I am. I'm going to live into where I am right now. I'm going to take joy in where I am now. And so what if we said, fasted from social media for a week and said, less, less FOMO, more JOMO. Can we do that? Let's try it. You know, social media has some redeeming qualities. It really does. But it can be very dangerous. And when we log on, we're just constantly being bombarded with all this other stuff that 25 years ago, you just don't care about what somebody ate for breakfast yesterday morning. But it's on social media, and they can cook better than you. And it goes down that line of, I'm a terrible cook. Or their kid's riding their bike without training wheels, and my kid still needs it. Or they can hit a baseball. Or they can swing a golf ball. Or whatever it is. And it, oh, I guess I must be a failure. And that's just... That's a, that's a really hard road to li- place to live in, and yet that's where a lot of folks live at some level uh, a, a lot of times. So what if you fasted from social media? And, and then uh, closely related, fast from cable news for a week. Fast for cable news for, for a week. Just uh, MSNBC, Fox News, Politico, Drudge Report, whatever you read, what if you just shut it off for a week? And go back into it. Don't just disconnect forever. Go back into it, but go... Go back into it with the reality that Christ is on the throne, and he's been on the throne since the beginning of time, and the problems we face here in America are going to be problems that are going to be here tomorrow, and you're probably not going to be able to do a whole lot about it, so we're going to pray for folks, but for some of us, the most spiritual thing we can do this week is log off of social media and log off of cable news or our internet subscription news that we have so that we can be present, because most of us are being discipled through social media and news networks and not from the Word of God. 
And so we need to get in touch with that. And we need to get in touch with who God is and who he created us to be. And you know what? You'll probably start viewing the world a bit different. You probably won't be as angry. And you probably won't be as anxious. And then spend hour, one hour watching creation. Go somewhere, find the shade tree, get up early in the morning, go late at night, watch the sunset at one of the lakes here in town, sit under a tree, watch the ants, watch the, the trees rustle, and just look at all that happens in the world that you don't control. And just be reminded of that. I think it's so important. Whatever might be stressing you out, whatever you're tempted to fight, run from, blame, what if you allowed Christ's words to be yours? Christ's sufficient strength for today. Tomorrow's tomorrow. Christ's sufficient strength for today. A worried life is a wasted life. The invitation from Christ is to move out of the house of fear and into the house of freedom. Out of that place of imprisonment, into that place of freedom. Don't let worry empty today of its strength. Christ's strength is sufficient for whatever I face today. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that challenges us. I realize for, for in my own life, this is one that's deeply personal. But we struggle. We struggle with this. We, we, we like control. We like to know. We, we see bad stuff happen all the time. Lord, help us to be rooted in you. Help us to be rooted in your love that was revealed to us on the cross, the empty tomb you are for us, not against us, that you have forgiven us for our sin. And even if the worst may happen to us in Christ, we have eternal life. Lord, help us to live that out this week. And help us to be present where we are with the people you've put in our life. And if we miss out, we miss out. But we have joy in where we are, who we're with, and who you've made us to be. We need your help with that. So we ask you to help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.